The story of Perry Ellis International is an American success story. The story of a family of immigrants who through their hard work and dedication have built one of the leading apparel companies in the nation. George Feldenkrais fled Fidel Castro's Cuba with his wife and infant son in 1961. He arrived in Miami new to the country and new to the language with just $700 in his pocket. George did bring his excellent negotiating skills and his contacts with manufacturing companies in Japan and Europe. I have a problem. I don't know what's important in the United States. And this is 61, this is not 2003. Now you're going to Walmart or Home Depot, you know everything that's imported. In those days, everything was made in the U.S. So you have to, first of all, you have to learn what can you sell in the United States. And uh, secondly, then go look for it. George began his import business by selling anything he could get his hands on. Screws, glass, and automobile clutches. In the early days, George found his niche selling Japanese automobile and motorcycle parts. This led to the creation of his first company, Carfell. When Americans go crazy buying Japanese cars, there were no parts on the, for the automatic transmission especially. And I specialized in that. That was the niche on Carfell. In his business travels to the Far East, he began establishing the network that would enable him to launch a global trading company. In 1967, George and his brother Isaac established Supreme International. They started first by importing children's school uniforms from Japan into Puerto Rico. Then they focused on Guayaberas, the four-pocket embroidered tropical shirt that is one of the most authentic symbols of Latin culture. I went to work with this Japanese company that was making the shirts. And I asked him about a while there, and of course they didn't know what it was, so I, I, I sketched it on a piece of paper. And a Japanese told me, oh, chotomate kudasai, chotomate kudasai, and wait a minute, and it goes out and come back in two minutes later. It's a Mexican wedding shirt. <laughs> that was a way of it. <laughs> George expanded the business to Miami, where he became known as El Rey de la Guayabera or the Guayabara King. His success in selling the casual Caribbean shirts to major department stores during the 70s laid the base for explosive growth in the decades to come. We hired a salesman in Miami. We started to sell to national shirt shops in those days, and we finally were able to sell Kmart in Miami, and Sears had a buying office in Miami. In 1980, George's son Oscar joined the company. I started out at Supreme at the lowest level, working in every aspect, calling on specialty stores, and I learned how to negotiate with the specialty store guys. Oscar's keen fashion sense, aggressive sales vision, and instinct for branded business propelled the company forward. We had to diversify ourselves. My father's business at the inception, uh, because of the automobile growth that was he was building and the motorcycle parts business, there was nobody really leading the way to, to develop Supreme into a much stronger entity than what it was. In 1988, Oscar introduced the company's first major brand, Natural Issue. The line of casual shirts, sweaters, and pants soon became a leading label in men's sportswear. But while we were always selling Kmart and we were selling Walmart and Target, we felt that the best way to continue that growth was to sell the department stores under a brand. And that's exactly what we did, and that's how we created Natural Issue. And that's really what uh, allowed us to grow. As president and COO of Perry Ellis International, Oscar broadened the company's portfolio, increased brand awareness, and created a brand presence across all levels of retail distribution. My father always told me, son, you continue to sell and I'll worry about the financing side. And that's how basically we always developed our team. In 1993, Supreme International completed its initial public offering on the NASDAQ stock market. The infusion of cash enabled the company to activate its brand acquisition strategy. 
understanding that brand recognition is the key to survival in the retail world, the company set out to find underperforming brands at bargain prices. A few months after going public, I went to an auction where a company went under that had several labels that we have to this day. The company starts to grow then, and then we realize that when you have a brand, you have something that the retailer wants to talk to you. The company began adding brands that possessed a distinctive heritage and impressive reputation. In 1996, the company acquired Munsing Wear, and in 1999, it acquired Manhattan and John Henry. Munsing Wear was a golf brand and was a premier national brand with a tremendous amount of equity, and we felt that the, our next opportunity would be is how do we develop a niche into golf? And that's why we decided to buy Mungs and Wear, which came to us at a time that uh, there were no other brands available for sale at a price point that was lucrative for our company and that would position our company totally different. The company's key acquisition came in 1999 with the purchase of the rights to the Perry Ellis trademark. And we feel that we purchased Perry at a very, very, very reasonable price, that the value of the brand today uh, would be much higher if it would be on the market. The company changed its name from Supreme to Perry Ellis International to better reflect the name recognition that the brand provided. We always dreamt with owning a designer brand because that's really what separates you from everybody else. Designer brands put you in a totally different level. Because if you have a design organization behind you, like Perry has in New York, the Salant organization, you are at the top of the food chain when it comes to apparel. And that gives you a tremendous advantage versus other companies that don't have that access. Entering the new millennium, Perry Ellis had transformed itself from a provider of mid-tier fashion apparel into an internationally recognized provider of men's designer fashions. In addition to its branded products, the company also continued selling products to retailers as private label. Perry Ellis International also entered into the corporate wear business at the end of 2001, providing a variety of corporations with high quality designer products. In March 2002, Perry Ellis International completed its acquisition of Janssen Corporation, an innovator in swimwear for almost a century. We have always had a fascination with the name, in my, in my case, because I know the name from Cuba. As we went into the due diligence, we found out that that was a tremendous opportunity uh, because it wasn't only Janssen swim, but the Janssen lifestyle, who had a lot of heritage, plus uh, they had the licenses to do Nike swimwear and Tommy Hilfinger swimwear. In May 2003, the company celebrated the 10th anniversary of its listing on the NASDAQ by opening the stock market. Thank you, thank you to everybody. Ten years ago, we stood before you as a new public company and a proud member of NASDAQ. Today, we celebrate our company's accomplishment of financial growth, high record valuations, and our recognition as a leader in the fashion industry with distribution in over 10,000 stores. In June 2003, Perry Ellis International acquired Salant Corporation. Salant had been the largest licensee of the Perry Ellis brand. The merger created one of the biggest men's sportswear companies in the world. It gave Perry Ellis International greater control of the Perry Ellis brand and added new brands to the company's upscale channels of distribution. Today, Perry Ellis International is positioned as a major designer, marketer, and licensor of a broad range of apparel products. It offers a family of brands that spans the spectrum of retail distribution. It employs over 1,400 talented associates around the world who execute the company's core efficiencies of sales, marketing, operations, design, and sourcing. Perry Ellis's customers admire its innovative products and level of service, while consumers appreciate the lifestyle brands and leading edge fashion. There is a big opportunity for us in some particular brands and some particular products 
We should be able to grow at a rate of 50, 100 million dollars a year for the next few years.